White says this. Now, we read this yesterday, and so I want you to put this into perspective with what she says here. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from the violations of the laws of health. We learned about those laws of health yesterday, didn't we? Eight laws of health. In the case of sickness, remember this is the first of the four R's. The cause should be ascertained and then unhelpful conditions should be changed. Wrong habits corrected. Then, so this is part of the repair process, then nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to re-establish right conditions. That's from the pen of inspiration. So why are we talking about these two theories? There's a saying that goes like this. If you always do what you have always done, then you'll always get what you've always got. So in 2020, traditional germ theory started to be discussed by many practitioners and research into to rain theory um, commenced. Our intention today is to encourage you to do your own research. Just to remind you, germ theory is the invasion of the body by microorganisms and terrain theory is about the imbalance of the body's inner environment which results in disease. So you might be thinking, well, what does all of this have to do with wounds? A lot, a lot. Okay, and you'll see that through this presentation. So I want you to think um, over your lifetime, have you ever had a wound? Have you ever had a cut, a, a graze, um, maybe a more severe wound? Has anyone ever had one? Yep, yep, well, everyone. Everyone's had one before. As a child, I had quite a few. Falling over this, falling out of that, breaking, well, no, I didn't break, sprain, twist, all sorts of different things. So wounds, there's lots of different types of wounds. I'm just going to classify them. So they could be open or closed, they could be penetrating or non-penetrating, and they can be acute and chronic, or chronic. So as you can see, there are several different types of wounds. So how can you help yourself at home to heal yourself? I believe that Jesus is coming very soon and there is a time coming up very quickly where we're not going to be able to buy and sell. So it's really important that we are prepared. With the new therapeutics products bill, it appears there will be new regulations for over 300 commonly used natural remedies. It really appears to be the beginning of restrictions so we need to know how to use God's creation to help heal ourselves. Are you aware of this bill? Are you aware of the implications of the bill? Did you realise that if you want to buy vitamin C, you will probably have to go to your doctor and get a prescription? What about the herbs that you grow in your garden? So here is a slide that looks at a snapshot of the more well-known of the 300 herbs that are looking to be restricted. Are you aware of this, Bill? Hmm. It's interesting how it's just been slid quietly in stealth in while everyone's on holiday, isn't it? So it was talked about just prior to Christmas and submissions can go into government until um, the 15th of February. And then, and then it's going to be passed. So basically there's going to be a regulator who's going to make those decisions about how these natural remedies or which natural remedies you may have access to and which ones you may not have access to. So what are some of your thoughts on this? I see some hands waving.
Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Good point. Yes. Great point. So what will happen then? Because I know that um, what I read is that uh, a number of um, Maoris use a lot of the heritage natural, software, yeah. which is part of their um, part of their mm. life, really. Yeah. So mm. will they be able to take all of that away? We don't know. We don't know really what. I mean. The limited reading that I have done, and that's the, I mean, there's only limited information that is out there. People are writing about it. Um, we don't really know what this means. We know, though, that it is the beginning of restrictions, isn't it? And we know, as Seventh-day Adventists, what that leads to and what this can potentially lead to. What we're trying to do today is not to provide you with answers but to provide you with thoughts for you to go back and research and go and, like you said, um, go and put a submission in. Go and share your thoughts on what you think about this, okay? You've got a few weeks, go and do that. I mean, this is where we potentially won't be able to grow and use natural things like, I saw up there, comfrey. I use comfrey all the time. My son broke his arm and his leg at the same time, um, and I use comfrey as a way of healing the bones. You know, I mean, comfrey grows as a weed, really, isn't it, even though it's medicinal, on the side of the road. Um, there's so many different things. I, I, I was talking to Carol about this for, at length. You know, cinnamon, it, it's up there. I mean, castor oil, we use it a lot. Aloe vera. You know, there's many different things that we use on a regular basis to heal ourselves in many different ways. So it's just something that we wanted to put out there, we wanted you to think about and go and do some research on. Ooh. So, actually this morning, as we were putting this side presentation together, we thought we were going on with the script, don't know, we're not. We're not. Um, Carol said, hey Renee, look at this. So New Zealand doctors, um, Facebook, no it wasn't Facebook, no, it, wasn't. it was a, a It was a telegram post, post. Said from New Zealand doctors sent to um, all of those who are on their website. Um, so New Zealand doctors speaking out with science have a telegram page that they put out regular um, media releases and this one came this morning. So um, it says, for thousands of years Humans and animals have maintained their health by eating the fruits of the earth. There is overwhelming proof of the link between poor nutrition and almost all diseases. Amazing. Amazing. And then they went further and said this one. The necessity and benefits of broad natural diet are evident from Egyptian skeletal remains from thousands of years ago, which suggests scurvy, a disease resulting from the lack of vitamin C. In 1753, a Scottish surgeon, James Lind, demonstrated that scurvy could be treated with citrus fruits. Now, um, before Carol was saying that possibly vitamin C could even be something that you have to go and get a prescription for. You know, but it's been around forever, used, and there's so many medicinal benefits with it. And, um, you know, so we encourage you, go and put a submission in, go and do some research on it. Find out what this therapeutic bill is all about. Who um, was onto it? Yeah. Something in it. 
Absolutely. So we're going to talk about three components of wound care today. So Carol's going to explain the three different components that we need to be watching out for. Okay, so the first component is biofilm. And biofilm is made up of a colony of microbes which allow bacteria to adhere to themselves and to the surface of the wound. Biofilm affects wound healing, especially chronic wounds due to the destructive enzymes and toxins which promote chronic inflammation within the wound. Biofilm actually looks like a shiny surface across the surface of the wound and this needs to be removed before any wound healing can begin. The second component is bacteria and of course we know that there are good and bad bacteria on our skin and they can get into a wound. But when a wound becomes infected, there is an imbalance between those bacteria, which create the toxins and destroy the tissue. So the bad bacteria are the ones that actually form the biofilm. So for wound healing, we need to control the biofilm and the bacteria. And once a wound is given the right conditions, it can heal itself. So we're going to look at, can we do some healing at home? If we address biofilm and bacteria, then can we help that wound heal? Okay, so this is what we're going to look at today. And we believe that we can. And so we've got to, like Carol said, you've got to address the biofilm. You've got to ensure that the body is balanced so that the bacteria are not fighting against each other and making that wound worse. And then you can address the wound healing because you certainly don't want to close up a wound if those so-called bad bacteria are in there, okay? So let's have a look at this. If we're going to um, address biofilm, these are some of the herbs that you could use. Okay, so you could take a photo or you could come and see us later. We're happy to share these slides with you. So these are some of the herbs that you could use. So you could use rosemary, chamomile, thyme, oregano, garlic, peppermint, uh, tea tree, eucalyptus, ginger, turmeric, cranberries, honey. This is just a small snapshot of some of the ones that you could use. There are many more, and it depends where you're from as to how accessible some of these are. If we're addressing the bacteria, we could look at things like cayenne pepper. Ooh, ouch, but it does work, and I've used it many times on some of my cuts and wounds that I have. Uh, golden seal, turmeric, oregano, there's things like calendula, uh, usnea. Does anyone know what usnea is? What's usnea? It's like a lichen that yeah. um, forms on uh, a lot of the common oak trees. Yes. Yeah, on trees. Yeah, absolutely. It's abundant. Abundant. Absolutely. It's everywhere, really. If you open your eyes, you'll start to say, oh my goodness, it is everywhere. The way that I use usnea is once I've picked it, I dehydrate it, so I let it dry. If you don't have a dehydrator, you could leave it out in the direct sunshine for a couple of days until it gets that really crispy, hard feeling. And then I blend it up, and I have all my little bottles 
labelled of all my little remedies and then you do scoop of this, scoop of this and you've got your wound powder. So I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Um, yarrow. Does anyone know what yarrow is? It grows everywhere where I live. It is a weed. People would, yeah, my father-in-law says, it's a weed because he's a sheep and beef farmer and it grows everywhere. It's got like a little... Uh, lots of little tiny white flowers, or it could be yellowish flowers or pinky flowers, different colours. So you could pick either the flower or the whole stalk, and it's got these leaves. It can be quite tall, about around about this kind of height. Again, I chop it all up, dehydrate it, uh, blend it, and I use it for all sorts of things. I also infuse it in oils, and then take it out after four to six weeks and then you've got it infused. Okay, again, if you're not sure how to do that, go and watch that video that I talked about, that hub chat video with Dana Gazelshin. She talks a lot about this. Um, and then for wound healing, once you've addressed the other two, you, you can start to uh, close up that wound and allow the body, you can help the body start to repair and heal itself by with things like this, uh, marshmallow, comfrey, aloe vera, burdock and plantain. Now as I said, my son broke his arm, two weeks later broke his leg, and same side, left side, dear me, what a time, boys, eh? And uh, once he came in between all the cast changes, they would wash the area, and then I said, can I rub uh, comfrey oil on it and so I'd made the comfrey, taken it in, I would rub it on it, they'd sort of look at me like what's she doing? So rub it on it then they would put the cast on it and then two weeks later would go in again and get it changed and, and so over that course of 10 weeks when he had that on his leg, that's what we were doing. Once it came off um, we do it every single day morning and night so we have a little routine of what we do to try and help those bones heal. Here is a wound powder recipe. So, I mean, there's lots of different things that you could use or you could replace, depending on whether you have access to those things or not. So, if you, say for example, didn't have the yarrow or the calendula, you could go back to the other slide when it talked about the bacteria. You could say, oh, but I do have this one and this one, and I could use those. Okay, so you can sort of mix and match some of these things. There's different ways that you could use it. You could use it as a dry powder and then mix it with something like a honey, which we're going to talk about in a moment because that has many medicinal benefits as well. And that's really, really easy. So if you had that already mixed up in your jar with wound powder written on it and your child came in or your husband came in because he chopped his finger off or whatever it was, um, and, and you could grab the, the honey as a sticky agent and mix a spoon of that into it and apply it straight to the cut. Okay, or you can make it into a balm or a salve and that's very easy to do as well. We're going to look at um, a story that, an experience that we had as a team. A few of us, um, Sheree, I'm going to get you to come up. Uh, we, we visited a man who had probably one of the worst cases of cellulitis that we'd seen. And Cherie's going to tell you about it. Um, I was just walking in a church one day and um, someone grabbed me and said, come and have a look at this, Cherie, because she had been coming to our natural remedies um, evenings. And so I bustled off, and when this um, dear elderly gentleman lifted up his pants leg, I just saw this shocking swollen leg that was... Redder than that, um, it was just horrendous, absolutely swollen, red, tight. And this poor guy had was so sore, he said um, he didn't know how he got to church, but he knew he had to be there that day. So he had had the cellulitis for many, many weeks beforehand. He'd had hospital visits, he'd had IV antibiotics, and he was on oral antibiotics, but it was just getting worse and worse, so that's where we saw him. Tell us what you do, what we do. Oh. Tell us about it. So I grabbed Renee. I said, Renee, we've got a um, mission this afternoon. So um, we went there in the afternoon and um, prayed. And um, he was willing to let us do anything that we could to help. So we initially started with um, hot and cold therapy. 
And to, initially to the hot water, we put in um, charcoal um, to draw out any um, impurities that were, um, actually we used such old buckets that we found in the outside of his house that we had to give them a scrub. We thought that the charcoal would actually take um, <laughs> anything out of the buckets too, so we used that initially. And then um, Renee um, put on a potato poultice, which we're going to learn about later on. Yes. Yeah, just in the hot water, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, we'll talk about um, on tomorrow, actually. We've got um, a little session on hydrotherapy, yeah. So we did that and we enlisted his neighbour um, and she repeated the, those treatments um, for a couple of days. And then we moved on to something different because he said, oh, goodness me, I don't want to have any more potato poultices on my leg because we uh, did the whole entire leg from above the knee, that's where it was swollen and red, all the way down to right into the foot. So this was kind of like the biggest potato poultice we'd ever seen. We grated almost like the whole bag of potatoes to do it. So what did we move to next? Do you want to talk about this well, Carol one? knows what we moved to next. Do you want to talk about it, Carol? <laughs> So um, after um, the neighbour had been treating um, for a week, going in twice a day, um, I went with Cherie the following week to do a hot and cold treatment and um, his leg by that stage was looking heaps better. Um, there was still a little bit of redness and mostly around the um, ankle and we thought, well, he didn't particularly want the potato back on, did he? Yeah. So we tried a cayenne pepper poultice because cayenne pepper stimulates the blood supply. And if we um, go back to our wound healing, we need a really good blood supply in the area for that wound to be able to heal. So um, he did extremely well. Um, he lasted for four hours with a cayenne poultice on, um, by which stage it was really starting to burn when he took it off. And, yeah. and it, it feels like it's burning, but it doesn't actually burn. So it just feels like you're heating up to bursting, but it doesn't actually burn the skin. Yeah. yeah. And can you talk about this garlic? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, the so then I um, decided that rather than putting on um, packs, let's um, start with massage. Um, so we did the hot and cold packs and I made this um, oil that you make with coconut and garlic. So you um, gently heat the um, garlic and the coconut oil, let it cool and then use that as a massage um, cream. And the benefit of using an oil rather than water is that the oil actually goes into the tissues and through the glandular system. And um, so that's why it um, impacted the cellulitis so well. And then after about four weeks, oh no, after no. about a week he said to the, he went back to his doctor, mm -hmm. didn't he? And the doctor looked at it and said, well, whatever you're doing, keep doing it, because that's amazing. So there was a huge improvement after a week, a, a absolutely amazing improvement after two weeks. And then when he came, he started then, he decided that he was going to come along to a natural health series that we run every Tuesday night. And he came along to that and he said, so he's had a stroke and he is left side affected as well and he walks with a, a walking stick. And he said in 25 years since he's had the stroke, he's never been able to point his foot to put his trousers on. He said, watch this. And he pointed his foot to everybody that was there and he said, it's the first time I've been able to do it in 25 years. And this was the leg that had the severe, severe cellulitis. Isn't God amazing? Yeah. Through natural remedies, simple natural remedies, God can heal. Amazing. Vanette, thank you, ladies. Vanette's going to come up and she's going to talk further about some other natural remedies. Um, so we've just heard a little bit about wound care and ulcers and um, Carol was talking about the biofilm that needs to be removed before any wound healing. So there was quite a few natural remedies that was on there but we're just going to mention a few of them. So firstly um, we're going to look at honey. So honey is an ancient remedy 
and it has internal and external benefits. Honey is antibacterial and anti-inflammatory. So externally, um, honey can be used, um, but not only limited to skin problems, sores and wounds, bites and skins and stings, gangrene, and even cataracts. And then internal uses, it can be used for bronchial problems by inhaling honey and water. It even helps for migraines if you have a one or two teaspoons. Yes? Cataracts, yes. Um, well, there's some of these books in the front, so it actually explains it quite well how you use it. Um, you thin it with a few other things and put a few drops into the eye. But um, just read up on it properly before you go and attempt that. But yeah, it does work for cataracts as well. And um, even for migraines, if you have one or two teaspoons, um, it says it helps within 30 minutes. It helps with bedwetting. If you have a teaspoon, if um, there's a child with bedwetting problem, one teaspoon before bed. It even helps with cramps and arthritis. So how honey works, it actually absorbs the moisture. So as the honey withdraws the moisture um, from the area, the germs need the moisture, they actually shrivel and die. So in that biofilm that um, Carol was explaining, so if the moisture is extracted from them, they actually struggle to survive. So that's why we would um, place that on a wound um, to try and get rid of that biofilm. So honey also kills most of the um, harmful bacteria such as Staphylococcus and also a lot of bacteria that's resistant to most antibiotics. Manuka honey is also very effective in treating burns and um, there's been quite a few studies done with Manuka honey and ulcers in diabetic patients. So um, there you can see the rate 43.3% oh, success rate in diabetic related foot ulcers. So most of you would probably know this, but um, people with diabetes does not have very good blood supply, especially in the feet. And the other problem with this is that they have um, neuropathy, so they've got nerve damage um, because of the high blood sugar levels. So if there's a small ulcer, um, normally they cannot feel it, and they usually only notice it once the ulcer is quite big. So it's very important for diabetics to examine their feet quite often to make sure that there isn't an ulcer that they're not aware of. Um, so those ulcers doesn't heal easily, um, but yeah, 43.3% success rate with honey treatment. And then um, with other ulcers, not specifically in the feet, but around the body, it's 97% um, success rate of healing those ulcers. And then um, honey also helps to suppress cough in children, so we'll be addressing that a little bit more tomorrow. Um, so there's a picture of quite a bad wound. So that is actually my grandmother's um, ankle. So she fractured her ankle a few months ago and um, she had a cast on. Um, she is also a diabetic and um, she's got neuropathy in her feet so she doesn't feel them very well. But when the cast was removed, the photo towards um, the right hand side, that's what it looked like. Um, so there was quite um, necrotic tissue around that wound. And um, she didn't really feel much in that wound because of all the dead tissue and the nerve damage. But um, my mother was the one that was treating her because she's in South Africa, so I wasn't treating her. But um, my mother debribed the area, so she got rid of all that um, dead tissue in that area. And then she actually placed a honey dressing on it. So um, the second photo was a few weeks later. Um, after the honey dressing, so it needed to be replaced quite often and cleaned um, um, every second day. And she went back to the doctor to reassess the ulcer, and um, he recommended putting an antibiotic dressing on her ankle. So the third photo there shows after um, the antibiotic dressing was um, removed and cleaned, there was actually a regression in the wound healing and a bit more... Um, infection and pus draining out of the area. So my mom decided, no, she'll just be going back to the honey dressing. And the last photo there, the wound was almost closed. Um, but at this stage, it did take some time, but she continued with the honey dressings and um, exposing it to some fresh air and sunshine as well. And um, with her diabetes and her neuropathy, that wound is actually totally healed now. Where at first, when I saw the wound, I thought she's probably going to lead to an amputation of a foot or up to a knee with um, that dead tissue. 
So then the next thing, um, the next natural remedy would be turmeric. So turmeric has a lot of um, health benefits and there's more than 6,000 um, scientific studies actually conducted on turmeric. And um, combining it with honey has a synergistic effect. So um, it actually enhances the medicinal properties of honey if you combine the two. And um, if you can recall the slides that Carol did there where turmeric actually affected the biofilm, removing that bacteria on the outer layer, but it um, also affects the bacteria and kills the bacteria, which is, was the second stage. So um, it affects both of those two layers. Um, so it's quite good if you do have a, also anything that needs to heal is to actually mix the turmeric with the honey when applying it. Um, you can just do the honey, but you'll get a better effect if you add turmeric to it. Just note that it is quite yellow, so you will probably get some staining of the skin. And um, just interesting um, that I read up on turmeric, um, there's quite a few studies that shows that it actually matches up to pharmaceutical medicines, quite a lot of them. The first one that stood out for me was metformin. So some of you that's diabetic should probably know that medicine. So it helps to control the um, blood glucose, especially in type 2 diabetics. And um, it actually decreases the blood sugar a lot more than the normal metformin. And the other one that I found quite interesting is that studies were conducted on um, manic depressive um, patients. And um, some patients was on Prozac, some was only on turmeric treatment, and there was a group that combined the two treatments. And um, turmeric actually stood up to Prozac. They basically had the same effect. Um, so yeah, I thought that was quite significant. So then the other thing we should all have is the potato. So even though they bring in that bull taking away all the lots of the natural um, herbal medicines, um, we should hopefully still have a potato in our, in our cupboard or grow them in the garden to make sure that we still have a potato. So lots of health benefits on potato. So um, what does potato do for healing? So the potato is rich in potassium and phosphorus. So the skin has a lot of pores to absorb these minerals and to help with healing. And then it also helps to pull out the toxins out of the inflamed and infected area. So because the potato is alkaline, it absorbs and neutralizes the excess acid in the body um, because any bacteria or disease thrive in an acid environment. So they don't like an alkaline environment. So that is what the um, potato changes, the, the alkalinity of the body. So um, there's a few uses on potato. So there's quite a few. It helps with inflammation, strains, bruises, infections, boils, splinter, burns, um, prickles, lumps and tumors, hemorrhoids, that one I found quite interesting. If you cut it in the size of a suppository, it works quite well if you have issues with that. And then it also um, pulls heavy metals out of the body if you take it as a raw juice, and it even helps for stomach ulcers as well if you grate potato and ingest that or even drink raw potato juice. So we're just quickly going to demonstrate for you that don't know how to do a potato poultice. I'm sure most of you have tried this, but you can use one or two potatoes. And then you basically grate enough for the area that you want to put a poultice on. So obviously, like um, Mr. McDonald that had the whole leg, you know, you'd need almost a bag, but it just depends on um, the area of the ulcer. So I'm just going to grate a bit of potatoes, and then Renee will come to the front. So as, as um, Vanette's grating, I'm just going to tell you a couple of stories because as I, a number of years ago when I started learning about all these different things, my, um, my go-to was Barbara O'Neill. And I'm sure we all know who Barbara O'Neill is, but it was her stories that I remembered in those times of, you know, my child comes to me with a twisted ankle or my husband's got a, you know, a sore, whatever. It's those stories that I went, oh, that's right, she said, do that. I didn't remember all the facts of the alkalinity and the, um, the acid and I have to do this to neutralise that. I don't remember all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a quick story. So my husband was cleaning at our house. I, by the way, I love potato poultices. We use it all the time. My children now just go and do it all the time. So my husband was cleaning one day and um, he 
It was outside, not inside cleaning, outside cleaning in the garage, and there was a basketball hoop, but not the hoop bit, the whole board with the hoop on it, and he was moving it around, and he dropped it, and it landed on his two little toes. And all I could hear was the noise and the screams of, ow, ow. Anyway, he came hobbling in. Within a very short amount of time, it started to go purple and blue and kind of black. And um, the two little toes were broken and he was feeling very, very sorry for himself. And he sat for the afternoon feeling very sorry for himself and on the seat. And I said, why don't I put a potato poultice on it? And he looked at me and went, seriously, no. I was like, no, seriously, let me put the potato poultice on it. Barbara said, because that's how I always say, Barbara said, it works. He was like, no, I don't need a potato poultice on it. It's fine. I was like, okay. Anyway, by that night, he was feeling very, very sore. I said, hey, how about I put a potato poultice on it? He goes, okay, I'll let you. Anyway, so, we, oh, he let me. Right, so I quickly went, made the potato poultice up put it right round his foot. So if this is his foot, I wrapped it both sides of his feet, uh, his two little toes, because the bruising had gone right around both sides. Okay, It was quite an impressive little toe break. Um, so I wrapped it right around, and this is the first time I'd ever used a potato poultice. So I wrapped it up, and, and Vinette's going to show us how to do it in just a moment. I put a sock on it, because you do not want potato juice in your sheets because it goes brown and yucky, okay? So that's a good warning. You could use something like one of these little blueies that, um, thank you SDL for getting these, and these are absolutely fabulous. You could make the poultice in that, okay? I know that Vinette's gonna make it on the chucks cloth, or you could put the, um, that underneath your limb or wherever it's sore to make sure that it doesn't leak everywhere. And if you're wondering what in the world what it was that I grabbed, it's just these. It's puppy training pads. Now you can get the medical ones that are like three times the price, or you just go to Kmart and get those. Fabulous. Anyway, so next morning, we were like, oh, let's have a look, let's have a look. And even he was quite excited to see what it was like. So I took the sock off, unwrapped it, and we both looked at it and went, you've got to be joking. That is amazing. The bruising had completely gone. I could not believe it. It had completely gone. Even Jaden was like, wow, this is amazing. So I'm telling you, God has put amazing healing benefits all around us. We just have to open our eyes and do some learning about what we can use. So Vinette's going to tell us about this potato poultice. Okay, I've just grated half of that potato because we'll demonstrate it on Renee's hand. And then you grab a, any clean cloth. So I've got a chucks cloth here, but you might not have a chucks cloth at home if you need it. So you can use a tea towel, um, um, the puppy sheets, old linen, whatever you have available you can use. Okay, so we'll just place a bit of that potato to make a little pocket. And we tend to always wrap it in a third, a third. The reason why is that the, the third that only has one sheet on it or one ply on it is what you want to put against the skin. So you want to fold it as well so that the potato doesn't fall out of the pocket. And this would be the single layer of the, um, the cloth there. Obviously not that double layer. So you would put that on the skin. So we'll put that onto the hand. And then you would cover it with something like cling wrap, or you can use a bandage as well, just to secure it in place, and it um, will also get a bit wet. So wherever you put it on, just make sure you either put a plastic cover on it or glad wrap, because it will make your bedding wet if you keep it on for overnight. So a lot of questions people ask is how long do you actually keep this on? So that would all depend on what you are using it for. Um, so if it is something like a burn, um, where the heat needs to be pulled out, you would replace it quite often. So you would put it on, say, for five minutes. If the, the cold is out of it and you still you start feeling the stinger again, then you would replace it with a new potato poultice. So you keep on doing that until the heat is removed. Um, if it's a, 
a draining wound, you would replace it quite often for 30 minutes, then go up to an hour, and then go up to four hours until it's not draining anymore. And then you'll also have to reassess if there's an open wound with um, draining, a draining wound, um, that could also indicate that the blood is actually not pure and that there's a lot of toxins and the body is trying to get rid of it. So combining the potato poultice with something, they probably addressed this yesterday about the detox. You can, I just picked this, but it's so hot outside. You get these growing outside. Um, this is red clover. You can also get red clover leaves like this that is dried. So you can make yourself some red clover tea to help clean the blood out as well. And then, um, yeah, so it all depends on what you are using it for. But you can also assess the wound. If you feel like it's getting worse, then you discontinue the use and uh, maybe try a different natural remedy. Fabulous, thank you. I'll keep that on. So, oh yes, questions? I was going to say pulseless feet. Yeah, pulse potato poultice on both because what the potato does is draw out yeah for both ulcers uh, and um, definitely use hot and cold treatment to begin with because the hot will help stimulate the circulation and bring the blood to the area and the cold will take away the toxins and by doing that which we'll talk about tomorrow um, you're bringing a blood supply to that area Yeah, yes. so it's not so it's contrasting. And we'll address that more tomorrow, tomorrow. if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Yep, did you have another question? Uh, yeah. Yep, yep, keep going. Yes. That's, that's a really interesting thought, actually. And this is what we talked about yesterday, that everything now is, is somehow affected by the things that we have done in our environment, isn't it? Um, I, I, I guess I digress. Cherie's going to answer that in just a moment, and I digress. You know, yes, Manuka honey is known to have the best medicinal benefits. I don't always have Manuka honey in my cupboard when I'm treating. I just grab whatever honey that is. Sometimes it's just clover. But, um, Sheree, do you want to come and address that? No, it just um, reminds me of that quote yesterday that um, said that everything that, everything that God made, um, Satan has put yep. something in mm. 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 Satan has tried to destroy. You know the, the quote that Estelle read yesterday that everything that God has made, that Satan has tried to taint and change and modify so that it takes our focus and it takes the, the benefit that it was away from God. Debbie. We 
can continue this thought later. Okay. Interesting, interesting thoughts. Thank you. Okay, we want to move a little bit differently now and uh, have a look at this person. Do we know who this person is? It's Alan Harmon, Alan White. So this is in her younger days. So in 1844, we know this story well as Seventh-day Adventists. God called the sickly, shy, uneducated 17-year-old Alan Harmon, Alan White, into his service as an end-time prophet. Now, God intentionally called, and I love this here, he intentionally called the weakest of the weak. He didn't call the ones that was the most educated or the ones that could speak up the front the best. He called the weakest of the weak that in his strength, that in his strength, that his strength that may be made perfect in weakness, that his strength may be made perfect in weakness. So we're going to talk about the Adventist health reform message. And we know that this message was given to Ellen White, and it began in the mid-18th century, or the 19th century, which was the 1800s. So this was a time when medical ignorance was everywhere. Parents could expect that on average only half of their children would survive into adulthood. Could you imagine that? Half of your children surviving into adulthood? Isn't that terrible? And this was the case for Ellen White, Ellen and James White. Only two of their four children made it to adulthood. So, Renee, you said it was a time of medical ignorance. So, it was a time of bloodletting, of poisoning. Night air was considered dangerous. Bathing was a health risk. Tomatoes were considered a deadly poison, and real poisonings, such as tobacco, arsenic, and mercury, were considered curative. Drinking blood and eating raw meat was supposed to build good blood. Corsets squeezed the life out of fashionable women, and sanitation was unknown. Disease was a mystery. It was in this setting that God commissioned the great Adventist health reform movement. God had given us eight simple rules, the eight laws of health, the principles to live by, and had we abided by them, we would have had a happier and healthier life. Did you know that Alan White was told by God and warned by God in no uncertain, uncertain terms should our sanitariums, so that's our health institutions, should our sanitariums use drugs to treat disease. Pretty big, eh? Wow. She said no confederacies were to be made with these organisations. Mm. So our health message is based on these eight laws Eight simple laws. They were the laws that God gave to Ellen White. Because God said, if you're using these eight laws, this is what will heal you. You do not need any more than that. Did you know that our sanitariums were world renowned? People from all over the world came to them. Many famous people came there for treatment. But sadly, in 1912, our church leaders traded God's natural health laws for accreditation with the American Medical Association, and they began to use allopathic medicine. And accredita accreditation led to the permanent end of our health reform movement in our sanitariums and in our medical schools. No longer would we be known for our advanced principles of health reform. Medical students were required to learn pharmaceuticals against the counsel of the Lord. These were the only modalities that were approved by the Medical American Association and those were the only modalities that they could learn. God's approved and blessed natural healing agencies were eventually prohibited. 
Estelle's going to talk about natural remedies that you need to have at home and making up your own first aid kit. So we've only got a couple of minutes and she's going to share with us about that. bit interesting. Okay, so as you know, I'm a nurse, and um, and when um, I was at the height of my career, I could prescribe about 80 medications, and I did my master's, and I was ready to go, and then of course I lost my job due to the mandates of my personal conviction, and um, then of a sudden I'm like, what now? And then I made the most best decision of my life. I went up to a Sam here, I went to see me, sorry, see me here. I went up to Takuma because he was showing, he did a four day, a four week medical missionary course. I thought, okay, let's see what they've got to say. And um, I was a bit skeptical because I didn't know who these people were. And um, I went there and it changed my life. And um, out of all the study I've done, I thought, man, you know what? I've actually wasted my time. A lot of things no, but a lot of things I have. You know, I used to go to, little kids used to come and I used to look in their ear, oh yes, you've got an earache, here's an antibiotic. You know, not thinking there's any other, um, and I was brought up Adventist, you know, you'd think I'd know better about our, um, about what Ellen G. White says. Anyway, so, um, so I thought, okay, you've got an earache. So what we would do now, we'd get a onion, chop it in half, stick it in the oven, steam it, take it out and put it on the ear. You know, there's so many, lots of simple remedies that we can have that God has given us. So I thought, okay, my first first aid kit was this red one here. Okay. And, but it had, it had nothing I needed to do medical missionary. And I was like, okay, I need to change that. So I got me another suitcase, and I'm going <laughs> to quickly show you what's in there. Don't get to, um, it's actually very simple things in there. And these are things that you can start collecting now, um, and you can go as big and as small how you like, that you can start collecting now. So when you're learning about all these things, you can do to other people. And there is, you can see you can see change, you can see healing. And if we do it in the right spirit, if God is with us, we pray every day that he's in our hearts. If someone comes to the problem, um, we don't have all the answers. We're all in a journey. Look them up, you know. If you go, okay, um, Renee spoke about charcoal or honey. What did I do? So this is our, we already said about it, this is our go-to book. Look it up. You go to the beginning and it tells you, um, just going to there, so... So it's got there natural remedies, poultices, potato, onion, cabbage, castor oil, cayenne, slippery. So there's a whole lot of um, natural remedies you can find in here. Okay, there's nutri nutritional notes. There's um, all the herbs. I've started my own herb garden in the last few months. How exciting. And I've got all these different pots and I label them with stones because I can't tell different leaves from different leaves. And it's very exciting. It started with, um, I've got about 20 um, in the ground and I feel like I'm a little bit prepared now. I can smell eucal you know, eucalyptus and peppermint. And, so, and they actually still, you, you can find them at the health stores, at the um, like odorings, the plant, plant shops. And even the warehouse sells some herbs. Okay, so to go into our first aid kit. So um, what do we need when we're doing a poultice? Generally, you will need a bucket of some sort. There's all different types of buckets you can get. This is a collapsible bucket. They open and shut. Um, and then you have some natural remedies that obviously don't go off in your bag because pota generally potatoes, onion, lemon, you can get this at someone's house. So we've got some ginger. Um, so if you want to make notes as you go, or the, we could put some um, notes up there. Um, we've got some black seed. What are you going to do with the black seed? You're going to mix it with a little bit of charcoal, which is here. Charcoal, okay. Then okay. Um, this is melted now, but coconut oil, very, very useful. Then we've got... Um, ca uh, castor oil. Now the cheapest place we found castor oil is um, Indian shops. You find them, and castor is a great thing to absorb. Um, so poultices take out, this absorbs into the skin. So if you've got a really sore knee, you just put some on one of these, wrap it around your knee, and it soaks into the knees. If you have osteoporosis, great. If you've got sore, for, for sore bones and, you're, and your arthritis, it sucks really good into your bones. It lubricates the bones. So castor oil. 
Okay, so you need something to mix it up with. Okay, here's some cups. Good old Glad Wrap. Okay, this is a few, um, I got given these, but you only need a few. What, what type of, um, what type of uh, essential, essential oils would you need? You only need, what's, what's a very good one to need? Teacher oil, yes. Lavender, peppermint, yes. Eucalyptus, Eucalyptus that's right. Um, some paper towels. Now, this is a really odd thing to have in your um, first aid kit, but these are great for your poultices because they, they're really good. You just put them on and you, it's just nice. It contains it all. Some pads there. All right. Epsom salts. Okay, if you've got a high fever, you put some Epsom salts. It, it is Epsom salts, I'm pretty sure. You put it in the bath and it'll help bring the fever down for the kids. Okay. Um, what else do we have in here? I've got a bucket in here. It's amazing what you can fit in. <laughs> what you can fit in. So I do have this, and not everybody has this, and that's okay. It's just a blood pressure kit. Um, it's a blood pressure kit. It's a blood sugar kit. You can get these all from the pharmacy if you if you know what to look for. Um, if you know how to do it, on our medical missionary courses, we teach everyone how to take a blood pressure. What do they mean? What do these things mean? So it's always good to. It's always good skill to know. Okay, um, need some graters. I just get them from the op shop. They're so cheap. They, they, you know, I think I got them for about a dollar. So they, they don't have to be expensive. Um, just, look, just go hunt around for bargains. Okay, a sheet, a shower sheet. So that's something odd to have in. But if you do hydrotherapy, you can put the shower sheet on top of the bath to keep the heat in. Okay, for hot and cold um, baths. Okay, a little lava lava, a little blanket. We've got um, some water. There's some towels here. And then I've got just a, a box of uh, scissors, some dressings, ginger, plasters. Um, my, my son had, um, he, he had all these, there's some charcoal tablets, some Epsom, it's turmeric. And then we've got um, some cayenne pepper. Now, cayenne pepper. It's a very good thing to have in your backpack always. Why would you use cane pepper? What does that do? Does anyone know? For, for his prize, what does cane pepper do? Stops the... Yes. And what else does it do? Yes, you can give a prize. And what else? Is some a heart attack. How does it help in a heart attack? It thins the blood. Yes. So half a teaspoon and a little bit of water, drink it. If anyone says that they've got chest pain, it's not going to harm them, okay? And also, if there's internal bleeding, this is really bizarre, but if there's internal bleeding, it can stop the internal bleeding. Cane pepper, yeah, so uh, very good to have. So just a little, um, oh, then this colloidal silver. Colloidal silver, what we do is put them in some spray, spray bottles and um, you just spray on the back of your throat. Um, a lot of people, when they did a lot of PCR testing and that, um, we don't really recommend um, doing PCR testing. What you, you can blow into a nose and you, you put your, the end of the bud into the, the tissue. Do it that way. We don't want that. On the end of the PCR tip, it's got EA, which is ethanol oxide. Not very good for us. So um, there's different ways you can do that. But this is also a really good thing. You can spray it up your nose, spray it down your tongue. It's a good... Um, like a antiseptic, um, antibacterial, antibacterial. Very good. You can put it on your wounds, spray it on your wounds. Lots of benefits. So it's up to you guys to do some research in all these. Um, I know I'm learning all the time. So we've done up, we've done up these little first aid kits. Um, we haven't made any money on it. It's fifteen dollars, and it's only for your convenience if you want it. You don't have to. We've got fifteen here. So basically, in there, it's our little new start with the eight laws. There's a, a bluey, there's a bandage, there's some gloves, and we've got the five little things, which is just a go-to, we've got them on hand. Just a little convenience. So we've got um, a flaxseed. Oh, when you use the flaxseed, grind the flaxseed, okay? It's easier to mix, it mix as well. We've got cayenne pepper, turmeric, honey, and charcoal, okay? You can always add other things. This is just a good little pack to put in your first aid kit. So you've got the go-to ready to go. Um, just essentials, and if you forget what to use them for, you just get your little um, 
Beth Eden or your little training books and you just read it up because I forget what do you use for what as well as Renee was saying. So it's just really good to, um, to and keep practicing, keep practicing it. Um, on, to, in the, on the top of my first aid kit, always a Bible. Whenever you do your poultices, always pray with the people because God, healing comes from God, not us. And, um, and if it's God's will. So always keep a Bible with you. You never know when you can share scripture. What else do I have? Oh, Eight Laws. Very, um, very good. We, we, we have a little DVD player and you can just play it while you're doing, um, if people want to know more about it. And they can just watch it while you're doing their poultices. It adds a lot of conversation. What else do I have in here? Oh, this is quite a handy book. Um, Drugs, Herbs and Natural Remedies. If you find a really go-to book, um, this is a time we need to use our opportunities to get this while we still can. I know Carol and I, we, when we um, lost our jobs, we decided, okay, we need to get some medical supplies. So we did this order, and, um, and then about three months later, we did another order, and the things had um, just under doubled the price. We couldn't believe it. Um, so, so it's good to be prepared now while we still can. And I um, want to encourage everybody, it's not as scary as it looks. You just, you know, start working with pot um, potato and then add charcoal. And, um, and God has given us all these natural remedies to, to learn. Thank you, mm. Estelle. Amazing how much stuff you can fit in a suitcase. Oh, yes. And there's way yes. more things Lots than there yet. Towels and so if you like want some. any of these, just come and see Estelle, $15. We're going to finish with um, something that we can taste test. And we do apologise because we don't support eating between meals. So we've only made it a very small taste test. But this goes along with wound care um, that we're trying to heal from the inside out. So Cherie's going to talk about that. Okay, in addition to these fabulous balms and remedies, we can assist wound healing by how and what we eat and drink. First of all, nutrition is vital. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate today, but I'm just going to talk to you about um, making this delicious, fresh and healing salad that contains many of the essentials for wound healing. This is our pineapple salsa recipe. Vitamin C is a powerful and essential antioxidant and is found in our first ingredient, pineapple. Just one cup of pineapple provides 88% of the recommended daily allowance of vitamin C. It also has an enzyme, bromelain, which breaks down protein and aids digestion. Hydration is also important, and we add cucumber, which is over 90% water. To control the release of glucose, we need dietary fibre, which all our fruits and veggies have, but onion and avocado are fibre rich. Onions are rich in quercetin, which has an anti-inflammatory and antihistamine effect. And luscious avocados are rich in vitamins, minerals, fibre and omega-3 fat. We need to control edema or swelling around the wound, so we add a large handful of chopped coriander, which is a diuretic, and a great detox for our system, particularly from heavy metals. It is also rich in vitamin A, B, C, K and other minerals. To stimulate the circulation and to improve healing, we add a pinch of cayenne pepper. I haven't today, but um, some of us really love it. Now more vitamin C and quercetin, we add the juice of a couple of lemons or limes. A sprinkle of salt before stirring and voila, a delicious healing pineapple salsa. Um, so we've got um, some that will come round, um, but before we do that, if I just, um, if we just bow our heads and I'll pray to end our meeting and to bless the food. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for being with us here today. Thank you um, um, for opening our minds to something new that we may have heard. Please um, convict us if there's something we need to change. Um, help us to recognise the cause of um, our issues and to be able to um, correct those wrong habits. Give us the strength and give us your faith that we can um, move forward with a healthier lifestyle. Please bless this food that we're about to have. And thank you for, the, thank you for Jesus in his name. Amen.